Thank you so much, Don. Thank you to Bus Boys and Poets and Teaching for Change. I'm so delighted to be here. And thank you all for coming out on what is a really, really grim night. I'm delighted to see you. I do want to um, add my voice to Don's in thanking the co-sponsors. And I, I hope that by the time you leave, you'll understand why the co-sponsors thought that the event that the book is about is important enough for them to co-sponsor a speech about it. So here we go. I thought I would tell you first how I happened to write this book, because it's very much a, a Washington story. I moved to Washington some years ago to go to work at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And even though I'm still a New Yorker in my heart and I read the New York Times every day, I decided I had to read the Washington Post every day because I had to know what the people around me were reading. And so I read the Washington Post meticulously, pretty much cover to cover, including the style section. Now, I didn't know my colleagues well enough yet to realize they don't read the style section, <laughs> but I read the style section. And one day in 2007, as I was reading the, the style section, I discovered an article that was about a new stamp that had just been issued by the post office. The stamp was called Mendes versus Westminster. And according to the article, it was about a really important constitutional law case. My reaction was no. No, this cannot be. I taught constitutional law for 35 years and I never heard of this case. This is not possible. And so I said, I need to find out something about this. Started to do some research and I decided that Mendez versus Westminster was a really important part of American history. And somebody ought to write a book about it. And since it didn't look as if anybody else was about to do it, I decided that I would. So let me tell you what it was that I found. Let me begin by reading the very first part of the book. And I promise I'm not going to be reading a lot tonight. Soledad Fedori walked up to the schoolhouse door five little children in her wake. It was a warm September 1943 day in Westminster, California, home to some 2,500 residents and right in the heart of citrus growing country. American soldiers were still fighting overseas, but Orange County was peaceful and bustling economically because of the wartime demand for agricultural products and war factory materiel. Mrs. Fedori had come to the Westminster Main School to enroll her two daughters, Alice and Virginia Fedori, and her niece and two nephews, Sylvia Mendez, Gonzalo Mendez Jr., and Jerome Mendez, in the neighborhood public school. Here is the uh, picture of the Mendez children. Here is one of them, Sylvia Mendez, who becomes important later on in the story. And here are the two Vidori daughters and their mom, Soledad Vidori. Mrs. Vidori was welcome to the school and was told that her daughters could be registered. Their father had a French ancestor, and their last name sounded acceptably French or Belgian to the teacher in charge of admissions. Besides, the Vidori girls, as you can see, were light-skinned. The Mendez children, however, were visibly darker, and to the teacher, their last name was all too clearly Mexican. They would have to be taken to the Mexican school a few blocks away. Little Gonzalo Jr. would remember the teacher telling his aunt, we'll take those, indicating the Vidori girls, but we won't take those three. We were too dark, Gonzalo recalled. No way, an outraged Mrs. Vidori replied, and marched all the children home. Now, where did all of this happen? Orange County, California, Southern California. The green is Orange County, as you see, down near the Mexican border. They were part of the California Citrus Belt the belt that produced so much of the crops that went into the United States in the 1940s. 
And as you can see, while there's part of the citrus belt that's outside of Orange County, much of it is actually in Orange County itself. The reason that there were so many Mexican Americans there was that agriculture had expanded enormously during the 1930s and again during the 1940s in World War II. Western railroads had expanded, were able now to have refrigerated cars so that they could take produce to the east, and irrigation methods had already incre also increased so that there was a lot more agriculture being produced and now it was able to go right across the country. And the result was that there was a huge increase in the value of agricultural produce from California and there was a huge need for labor. And the labor came, for the most part, from Mexico. As you see, there was enormous immigration to the Southwest generally and to California in particular during the 1930s and the 1940s. And notice what's at the bottom of the screen, that by 1940, according to the U.S. Senate, just about 100% of the agricultural workers in California were from Mexico. I thought you might be interested just to see a comparison with today since Mexican-American immigration has been so much in the news. Looking at Arizona today, you can see that Latinos make up almost a third of the population of Arizona today and over 25% of the workforce. Notice the very first number there, 64.2. The farming industry is heavily dependent on foreign-born Latinos. This particular slide doesn't tell you anything about the Latinos who were born in Arizona, but you see how dependent agriculture is on immigrants, and this certainly was all the more so in California. Now, the Mexican immigrants lived in colonias in places that were on the outskirts of farms, on the outskirts of towns, settlements of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. And you can see that there are, they're clustered. Um, I don't know how well you can see the ones that are highlighted, Orange Grove, Westminster, Santa Ana, and then up towards the top, there's number 11. Those are the particular areas that will concern us tonight. The conditions in the colonias were totally horrendous. Work was not constant. When work was to be had, it was severely underpaid. You can see the difference between the average wages of women and men in the agricultural industry and in the United States generally. The living conditions were abysmal. Tuberculosis was rampant, not surprising in a place where that had really, really poor sanitation. To the Mexican immigrants and the Mexican Americans, because of course so many of them did become citizens and others were born in the United States, education was the way out. Education was the way out of the terrible working conditions for themselves. Education was the way out for their kids. But there was a bit of a problem there. In the late in the late 1800s, California had decided that it did not want its non-white children in classrooms with the other children. And so it passed this law, which was updated in 1935, saying that school districts could create separate schools for Indian children and for Asian American children. Notice, though, Mexicans are not mentioned. Mexicans and Mexican-Americans are not mentioned. And the reason was that when the law was initially passed, there were so few Mexicans in California that apparently they were not con yet considered a threat. By the 1930s, however, Mexicans were the largest minority group in California. And the reaction of many of the parents was to insist that the school districts create separate kids for the Mexican children. 
So this started relatively early. Pasadena created a Mexican school in 1913. By the mid-1920s, there were 15 such schools just in Orange County. More than 80% of the Mexican-American children were sent to segregated schools.